So I guess we need to start with the context, uh, which is the weakness in the public equity markets and the volatility, the return of volatility we've seen. How does that change the risk appetite of investors for private investments? Well, I think it comes down to those who are putting the capital to work today and buying companies. We've been waiting for this for a long time. Mm. So this dislocation is exactly what we've been sitting on the sidelines waiting for. Right now, we're seeing a, a true dispersion of return with top quartile performers and the median uh, market players. So when you you look at alternatives, we think this is exactly the right moment to be leaning in and finding opportunities around the world. It's not just a domestic market play, but it truly is an international play. And to find some of the interesting opportunities, you need to go global. Okay, let's go, go global first. Which countries are appetizing or do you have to go by sector before we can go global? I think you do both, actually. I think it's sector and I think it's geography, right? Us. So right now, I think, look at Europe. Uh, Europe is a couple years behind the recovery where the, that the U.S. has seen. So Leaning into Europe, you're seeing valuations actually lower than you're seeing in the U.S. today. Meanwhile, there are a lot of the same themes. Like one of the themes that we're seeing internationally is the theme of deconglomerization. Mm -hmm. You've seen corporates over the last, call it decade, really adding to, to the number of subsidiaries that they've had. And has that actually been the right thing for them? The market hasn't valued that. And we've seen that in the way many of them have been performing in the public markets. So we've come in, whether it's in places in Europe, buying from Unilever, um, the plant-based Spreads business that we just bought there, in Japan, in Korea, in, in markets really all over the world where you can take that theme, buy something that is non-core, that no one is really valuing. It's very complex. These are complex transactions. And I think the market is also not valuing complexity. Mm -hmm. So we can buy something complex. We can find value in that. We can make it better. And then at the end of the day, go sell it in a much more simple terms, with which the market, I think, is interested in buying. Europe is behind the U.S., but for good reason as well. There's a lot of uh, hot spots in Europe mm -hmm. to, to watch for right now, including Italy. Are there certain areas in Europe that you want to avoid as a result? I think we, right now in Europe, we look at the world in a very local way, right? You can go find a very interesting local champion mm -hmm. um, that maybe you can go take global. So you can actually diversify your risk. So you can buy a company, for instance, that's headquartered in, in the UK, that's actually trading at probably some type of discount because of the uncertainty in the political environment. As an example, you say Italy is the same thing. Mm -hmm. But if their revenues actually are not coming from 100% from that country, the discount is actually unwarranted. Right. So we can find value in pockets of the market like that. And I think that's really what we're going after today. It's pricing the risk and really trying to assess what the risk is. Is it a headline risk or is there something inherent in the company? You've talked about the supply side of the equation. What about the demand, the clients that you're looking to serve? I mean, how much risk appetite have they got at the moment? Right now, they're chasing return. Right. I think they're very worried that the next five years is not going to look like what the last five was. Right. And when you think about the returns in the market, they understand there's going to be compression of returns and the traditional side of the market, public equities, um, public um, debt, is going to probably be hit harder than the alternative side, private equity, real assets, things of that nature. So they're understanding right now that they have to shift their asset allocations if they're going to want to achieve the returns that they've been achieving for the last several years. And I actually think that's a very, a very positive sign for per folks like us in the market where we're putting work capital to work on the private side. Um, markets of dislocations are ones that we've seen the best returns in. So I think investors are really trying to find what are the top performing managers? How do I lean in more there? How do, how do I give them more of the cash that I have on the sidelines so I can make the returns over the next several years? So there's a lot of cash chasing ideas. What does the steady increase in rates, especially here in the U.S., mean for private investments? Everyone keeps talking about how, historically speaking, rates are still very low. But if you look at it, they're at the highest in a decade. And that's a lifetime, at least for the younger generation of investors. I think that's, you're exactly right, right? I think it's a relative game to some degree. I think rates, even though they are higher than they've been in a decade, they are still very low when you think about KKR that has been around for four decades. Mm -hmm. We've seen a world that's looked very different from today if you go into the 80s and the 90s. But we're not going back to the 80s and 90s. Absolutely not. So, but I think right now what we are trying to do is we're trying to assess risk in the companies that we're, we're finding. And we're trying to make sure we're, we're paying for growth and we're paying for operational value creation, right? What is 
that mean? It means that we can go deep in a business and we can make it a better company. Mm -hmm. And if even if rates are 100 basis points or whatever number you want to put ahead of where we are today, we're still going to be in a place that we can drive bottom line returns. And we're not dependent on just over levering these businesses. What sort of returns are you now finding yourself having to promise or needing to promise or question. wanting? Yeah, I think, is it relative or is it absolute, right? Uh, and I think that's the debate we have a lot, which is on a relative basis, our investors want 500 basis points over the markets, okay. right? So if the markets take a big hit, that's, that's your benchmark, right? I think there is still an absolute piece to it though, right? When we're pricing deals, we're still looking for those high teens returns, which is very important to our clients. Within the U.S., what is the best opportunity you see right now? We just talked about Europe. We talked about overseas. How about domestically? Mm. I think it's the same trends, honestly. It's, it's buying complex businesses, finding very fragmented industries. Such where, as? Such as there's some healthcare businesses, there's some technology businesses where we can go in and do a roll-up, for instance. Or we can um, go buy a business like Farmerica, where we can go partner with Walgreens, and that gives us an edge, and we could do it in a very cost-effective way. That, that's where we're seeing a lot of opportunities. We're also looking at demographic trends as well. What are, where are the millennials spending their money? How are, is experiences over things more important? How do you think about aging demographics? Do you want to invest more behind healthcare, especially late cycle? That's a really good place to put your capital. So that's a lot of what we're seeing.